May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I think Japan is on all of our minds and hearts this morning. I, like many of you, I'm sure, have been praying for their peace following this um, horrible natural disaster and meditating upon how connected we are to a people who are an ocean away. It is that very ocean that connects us, as well as our history. We hammered out some important steps towards reconciliation after World War II. And we are also um, connected in commerce, particularly in our cars and technology. The earthquake in Japan sent ripples not only down our coastline, but those same ripples reached all the way to Wall Street. And I was very proud of Epiphany Outreach this weekend. They wasted no time getting an email contact with each other, discussing options for the best and quickest way that we can respond. And they'll be meeting today after our 10 o'clock service to discuss it. Understanding ourselves as connected to the rest of the world is something that we too easily forget. With everything that we have going on in our lives, it is very easy to live in a bubble and forget that what's going on an ocean away has everything to do with us and we have everything to do with it. We are connected and our emotional and spiritual amnesia does us no favors. In today's gospel, we hear the story of what happened immediately after Jesus was baptized. He was driven out into the desert by the Holy Spirit for 40 days of fasting and prayer. For 40 days, Jesus sat alone in the silence of his own heart, in the silence of the desert. And at the end of these 40 days, he was put to the test, tempted by all manner of things that we human beings desire. Now, we may not immediately identify our own desires and what was laid before Jesus. I, for one, have no interest in all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. But if we look at what is at the core of this temptation, we can see that it is wealth and power. And I think that is something we can all relate to on some level. Wealth and power can be anything. It can be a better, faster computer, a nicer smartphone, a new car, more money in the bank, a better social life, a raise, or maybe a few improvements we might like to see in a spouse or partner. All of these things keep us living outside of ourselves, living in this realm of desire for something out there in front of us. We see the beginning of this desire in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, seduced by the devil, took the fruit and ate. Now this story is part of our creation myth, a story that is true, not historically, but in terms of what it teaches us about who we are and who God is. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree, which God told them not to, they had their first experience of unchecked desire. They stepped outside the paradise of right living with God and into a world of desire where there is always something better just beyond. Now this idea of desire is not the desire of a healthy heart who seeks love and companionship, meaningful work, times of rest, healthy food and drink, and a good life to enjoy all that life offers. The kind of desire we're talking about is different. The same word in Hebrew, which we translate as desire, appears not only in this reading from Genesis, but also in the 10th commandment. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. So covet and desire are the same word in Hebrew. This propensity to covet, to desire what is beyond us, is what keeps us from experiencing the freedom of the kingdom of God here and now. 
Now Jesus unplugs this desire for himself. And remember, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, but Jesus is also fully human. He struggled in all the same ways you and I do. And he made it through. He found a way to life, not by negating the struggles or by ignoring them, but by being driven headfirst into them and responding from a place grounded in love. For every temptation and test, Jesus responds with love and with wisdom. Is there a better story for how to make the wisdom of the Bible relevant in our lives than seeing how Jesus did it so clearly and succinctly in this story? This propensity for desire to covet things, for reaching out for whatever is more or better or just beyond our reach, clouds our vision and keeps us from seeing what is true and good and beautiful in this life that we have been blessed with. When we can follow the way Jesus has set for us and unplug this desire, our vision clears and we will see what it means to truly love God and love our neighbors. We will see that we are not separate, disconnected individuals looking out for number one, but rather that we are connected to each other, neighbors all. We will see that what is happening in Japan is not happening to someone else out there. It is happening to real people just like us. And there are lots of different ways that we can approach the unplugging of this desire. And certainly, many Christian practices help us along this way. But I want to highlight one particular way that we are sorely in need of here in very, very busy Southern California. Can you guess what that practice is? It's one of the Ten Commandments, hint, Sabbath. The Judeo-Christian practice of Sabbath is a great way to begin to uncloud our vision and remove this power that desire has over us. If we can spend one day a week, and I know that's a lot to ask, but one day a week ceasing all day-to-day -day activity, Sabbath means to cease. So if we can cease this activity, and spend our time in recreative activities, from rest, spending time in nature, giving our wallets and bank accounts a day off from spending, connecting with our loved ones, eating a good tasting and good for us meal, reflecting on what is good and true and beautiful in our lives. We will find that what we desire is already in us. Because what we truly desire is to know the love of God in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls and in our strength. What else could we possibly want if this love of God is alive in us?